So oh, here I am with Steve Addison and uh, Steve. Uh, we've been friends actually for uh, more than a couple of decades. A few decades, Doug. Mm, a few decades. And uh, you have written multiple books, but now you've written a new book, The Rise and Fall of Movements, A Roadmap for Leaders. Mm. Why? Why, why? Why are we doing another book? Well, actually, I was planting a church out of this church, out of Crossway, about 30 years ago. And I began to wrestle with what is it going to take, not just to see one new church start, but what is it going to take to reach a nation, to multiply disciples and churches? And that's when I got interested in movements and uh, started looking at, you know, here's a, a snapshot of a dynamic movement in, in time. So if we found one that was healthy and thriving, it would have these characteristics. But then, you know, you look at history or even just reflect on your own experience and you'll realize that movements and ministries go through a life cycle. You know, they're on the rise and they're on the and they're also declining. We don't like to face that reality, but it happens and, and they need renewing. And so this book is sort of on that life cycle. We, we look at the snapshot of dynamic movements in a moment and say, well, here's about seven things that, that, they ha that they have. And then we look at, well, over time, how do movements rise and fall? And how does that impact a local ministry, like a, a local church or a mission? So in, in your book, you speak about uh, three things. You speak about identity, uh, strategy, and method. Yeah. Okay, just want to break those down for us. Help us sure. Understand. Well, let's, let's start with identity, because that was the aha for me. Uh, I drafted the book about 30 or 20 years ago, and, um, and I just felt there's a missing piece. So we could look at life cycle and just take it from the business organizational world and try and superimpose it on the church and now we've got you know a new diagram and all of that and i went back just a couple of years ago I went back and looked at the ministry of jesus and how it was grounded in his identity and for me the the realization came through the stories of his uh, baptism mm -hmm. and his wilderness testing because these two stories fall between his life in Nazareth as, you know, a carpenter and then his launch and the beginning of his campaign as the coming king. Um, so they're foundational. And you look at those two stories and, and immediately what hit me is at the heart of this movement that Jesus started and he still leads, three things. Um, he's a, as a son, his obedient surrender to the Father's will through uh, the Word. Uh, his dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, uh, his faithfulness and focus on the core missionary task. You know, he's come to die for the sins of the world. He's come so that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. He's come to make disciples. And so they're those three things that are part of our identity as his followers mm -hmm. and this is both why movements rise and why they fall mm -hmm. um, that we either move towards or away from you know uh, obedience to the living word dependence on the holy spirit faithfulness to the mission mm -hmm. so that's the identity piece mm -hmm. but there's also a strategy piece and you look at the ministry of jesus in the gospels and then the risen lord in the book of acts and you start seeing, okay, identities there, but then there are patterns of how he ministers. You know, one of them is um, he's always raising up pioneering leaders yeah. and they, they learn and are trained on the job. Um, the movements that he starts spread through contagious relationships. You know, the woman at the well or the demoniac or Zacchaeus, they're spreading along relational lines. Um, he rapidly mobilizes workers, not just the 12, but there's a whole band of men and women who at different times travel with him and he's always releasing ordinary people to go and tell their friends and family about what God has done for them. Um, and he's using what I call adaptive methods. So his methods are simple, there's, they're virtually zero dollar, and they're contagious and they empower ordinary people to do extraordinary things. 
So they're the, the sort of the strategy piece in terms of here are the patterns of his ministry and ministry we see in the New Testament. And then finally, there's the methods that we use in any given situation. Like contagious relationships is always a principle that ought to ground our strategy. But how are we going to do that in our context? And so methods can change. Identity must never change. We have to keep returning to that. Out of that, we need to be disciplined in applying those pieces of strategy. And then we've got to flesh it all out in methods, tools, systems, all of that in whatever setting we are. So that's a, that's a fairly large bundle, but it, it just gives us a bird's eye view of what is a missionary movement what does the missionary movement that Jesus founded look like? What does it do? Mm. Okay. Is the whole uh, life cycle idea, like the rise and the fall, is that like, that's just the way that it is? Is that, is, uh, is, is that what you concluded? Uh, life's a lot more complex than our models, but models help us understand. Um, they help bring some understanding out of the complexity. So you read enough history or just reflect back in your own experience. And we all know that ministries like rise and fall, mm -hmm. that they need renewing. Sometimes they get so far away from the gospel and their identity that they're, they're, they're no longer a Christian movement. Um, and new movements keep popping up. Mm. So that pattern, yes. And people say, well, how could the church of God fall? Well, read the New Testament. Mm. They're continually challenging the believers there. Uh, get back to the gospel. Mm. Don't move on from what you first received because others are coming in. Paul predicted this. Mm. The wolves are coming. Mm -hmm. They want to destroy the church. And Jesus, in, in his, his teaching about the time between his first and coming and his final return, he says, this is what's going to characterize the age. There's mm -hmm. going to be deceivers that are going to try and lure away God's people. Mm -hmm. So that's the reality. The kingdom has broken in, but we still live in a fallen world, and there's a battle on. Mm -hmm. you know? and we, 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 we're very confused about life if we don't realize we're still in a war. So yes, the rise and fall is a reality, but the faithfulness of God is the, the constant. Mm. So he's continually calling us back to our identity. Mm. Uh, he's even in a redemptive way disciplining us mm -hmm. individually, in a ministry, in a wider movement uh, to help us return to the first things, mm -hmm. which is Paul's whole mm. challenge to the Corinthians and the Galatians yeah, and sure. you know all of that. So in, in the absence of that willingness to turn, is yeah. it too much to say some things actually need to die? In fact, some things have died. I call it they do, the last phase is they're decaying mm. um, because they have abandoned the gospel. Mm -hmm. And uh, New Testament talks about that happening with people. You know, I've just mm. been working through 1 John and a whole group has left the church. Mm. And John, John says, look, if they were ever really part of us, they wouldn't have left in this way. They've, they've lost the gospel. Um, then I think, I think I'd, I'd like to see it in a positive sense. I'm thinking of a, a church like Crossway here. It's a massive church, especially for, on an Australian scale. Thousands of people. And I'd say not that, you know, is Crossway going to die? I'd say more, well, Crossway is at a more mature stage of development, okay? Um, but its renewal comes from a movement perspective as it becomes a parent and a grandparent. Um, and part of renewing, you know, it's, we ought to expect that over time, especially successful ministries are going to assume we'll just keep doing what we've always done and we're off we go the numbers are looking great you know and one of the best things that uh, a, a church can do in that maturity phase is to say uh, we're going to be renewed by the children and grandchildren we have in fact you know we look at our kids ministry and we're looking at future leaders not just for us but god's purposes everywhere so beginning to see how do we build renewal 
in the life cycle. In, in, you know, rather than say somehow we've got to be just like the latest new church plant or whatever. Saying, no, we're, we're actually, we're a large church. We're at this stage of development. Uh, we're going to be renewed as we keep releasing new life. Um, both, both here, starting new ministries and implementing new things, but also giving it away. Sure, so Crossway's not the normal. And yeah. um, so normal church um, in Australia and in America, the average one is kind of in the kind of mid to low 70 people uh, yeah. range. 50% of Australian churches are less than 50 people. So does this life cycle thinking apply to that more normative local church? Yeah, and that's the great thing, that it begins, the renewal of a church begins with a return to identity. So getting back into, you know, and, and, and I, I would dig deep into those two stories, baptism and wilderness, and, and say, well, how do we as a church renew our um, obedience and faithfulness to the living word of God? You know, so we've got a whole cultural shift going on at the moment. And there are church leaders that are terrified to speak out freely and openly about what scriptures teach about marriage and human sexuality. The degree to which church leaders in their fear of the culture are silent about the living word of God, uh, uh, then spiritual authority drains away. Doesn't mean you have to be nasty to people, but you do need to freely proclaim the good news and make that the, the center of who we are. And then, you know, we've got to return to that dependence on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Spirit comes to bear witness to the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. and to empower us for that. And we need to return to faithfulness to the mission, the core missionary task of making disciples. So churches can make those decisions to pursue those things but then they've got to say well how do we flesh that out now in raising up pioneering leaders in um, contagious relationships in um, you know mobilizing workers rapidly and adaptive methods so how do we build those into everything we do so is that effectively the engine room if, if i was if i was going to say to you like really what does drive rise and fall yeah I think you were just starting to describe some of the, the drive on the rise, and there are drive and the fall. Can we just speak specifically to that? What drives the rise? Mm. And then I want to ask you, what allows the fall? Okay. And this was, after 20 years of looking into it, this was the aha moment through those two stories of baptism and wilderness. You know, foundational for the movement Jesus is founding. I always thought what drove the rise and fall was the strategy stuff. You know, get, get some pioneering leaders in, you know, just make sure this is, the gospel's going out through relational networks and your methods are, you know, changing with the times and, and all of that. And the aha moment, you know, none of that is in those two stories. It's later on in Jesus' ministry. He, this, these are the patterns of his ministry. It's his identity. And in his identity, he's undoing what we lost in Genesis uh, when we fell. Three. Genesis 3. Yes. I was going to say 1 to 3, but we lost in Genesis 3. Obedience, dependence, faithfulness to the mandate God's given us. And so it's actually a call to return to who we are. And then out of that's the priority. Then out of that, um, in a disciplined way, let's let's apply these key elements of strategy. I'll I'll, I'll make it a bit uh, a bit sort of a. I'll give you an example. You know, I'm thinking of uh, a Don Waybright. They're in a he's missions pastor in a large church in the U.S. and um, the step for them was, you know, Don's heart uh, for that identity piece. But then there came a time where he had to lead the church into implementation. So what he did is he just got out with a small team 
into a prison system about an hour from where the church is in Houston. And they started sharing the gospel and making disciples behind bars in a maximum security prison. And the surprising thing is there was a move of God among the prisoners in, in, in solitary confinement. And the, the gospel started, how does it spread in solitary? Well, they're yelling out across the corridor from their solitary cell. People are, become, are coming to Christ. Men, uh, one, one guy there, his name's Jesus, has uh, been in solitary for 18 years. And I don't think it's because he didn't return a book to the li prison mm -hmm. library. And the gospel's changing his life. Prisoners are listening in as as other prisoners do discipleship in solitary, mm -hmm. yelling out to one another. Mm -hmm. And they're just reading the Bible and learning to obey it. That God's word's transforming them by the mm -hmm. power of the Spirit. And they're focused on the core missionary task, which is actually, let's make disciples in, the, in our world, the prison system. Mm -hmm. Well, hundreds of groups are now forming because Texas has a million prisoners. Mm -hmm. No, America has a million tech prisoners at any one time. Texas has the largest prison system and it's being blessed and space is being made by the officials. But the gospel is spreading prisoner to prisoner, group to group, mm -hmm. just by a return to our identity. And then they're applying strategies like, well, we need some pioneering leaders. Guess what? We're going to find them in the prison. You know, this is going to spread through contagious relationships. So, okay, they know one another, but they also have friends and family on the outside. Mm -hmm. So we want to see the gospel go to them. Mm -hmm. And they're applying the sort of the principles of strategy, but it's, it's a heart that, that knows its identity. It's not just a program. This is a work of God. And, and that sort of training is infecting the whole life of the church. It's trained 1,600 people in the life of their church in how to share the gospel and make disciples. And they're planting churches in North India, amongst in Mumbai, amongst uh, former prostitutes. They're planting churches in Colombia. So here's a local church that, and you might think, well, it's a big, another big church, Steve, you know. Well, all you need is one Don, you know. He doesn't have, it's not like thousands of people are in the prison. He has a small team in the prison system and they're not doing most of the work. They're the catalysts. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you're, you're, you're quite aware of who we are and how we are and what we do. And uh, so how do we remain vital as a mm. church? Yeah. Keep returning to identity. Keep, um, uh, keep valuing, soaking up, obeying, proclaiming the living word of God. Because it's not just, God's word isn't just sounds on the airwaves. It's God's word is, is God in action. When he speaks, things happen. And, you know, Jesus is the living word. He's the incarnation of the word of God. And yet he places himself in submission and surrender to his father's word. He only does what his father tells him to do. And he takes the scriptures very seriously as a living word. So just keep returning to that, which I know is your heart. And then um, getting into situations, because it's not just a written text, it's a living word. And the way that that word is applied to our lives and is through the Holy Spirit who is sent so that we would be witnesses to the ends of the earth. He's the Word and the Spirit are the only resources Jesus leaves behind when he goes to be with the Father, mm. and they're enough. And then keep returning to what's the core missionary task, because churches and successful, ch all sorts of churches, will tend to get distracted with programs good programs, but lose the gospel center and the question, is this leading to disciples who are making disciples mm. of others? And 
all of that social transformation, when it comes, is a byproduct and the fruit of the gospel. But churches lose, or the church loses its way when they become an end in themselves. And eventually you lose social impact. So that's the pattern of history. And then I think, you know, looking at the different stages in the life cycle, you know, birth, growth, maturity, decline, decay, I would celebrate the fact that, you know, Crossway's been in a huge growth spurt. And there'll be times where you'll teeter into maturity, which is, maturity is, let's protect what we've gained. You know, we're risking everything in birth and growth. Now, hey, we've, we've got our reputations, we've got our facilities, we've got, you know, highly educated staff, let's just protect all of this stuff and our position in society. Keep risking for the sake of the gospel. And you know, one of the best ways to do that is to say, hey, um, we are a church, but we're also fueling movements around the world, which is what you do with your commitment to world missions, what you do as you grow leaders here in this place, what you do as you multiply ministries. So let's be renewed by the reality that we're continually starting new things and we're continually giving away good people to, to his cause. And that's, then you become, okay, oh, we're not the coolest, latest thing on the block, but hey, there is a Crossway family out there who some of them don't even know they are, you know, because of the churches you've planted and the leaders you've given away. What we've found, the more we give ourselves away, the more we get that fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So a lot of the people who are watching and listening to this are pastors. Yeah. Speak to pastors about this, uh, this challenging domain. Yeah. I think I repeat what I've been saying about the identity question. Mm -hmm. That's where it begins and ends. And reflecting on my own development, you know, as a student pastor here, as a church planter and then a pastor, it doesn't always go in a straight line. You know, we get identity all sorted and then we're engaged with the strategy and the methods. Mm. You know, half, halfway through a very successful <laughs> church plant, in, you know, in that second year of the church plant, we had over a hundred, couple of hundred people. God decided to unravel me mm. and shape the church plan, you know, and we had some conflict and all of that sort of, which is actually for a rapidly growing new church, that's not, un and anyway, for any church, it's not unusual to have conflict, but it really shook me to the core. So here I am and I'm doing all the strategy stuff. I'm engaged and thinking all the identity stuff is taken care of. And the Lord sort of lets me run for about 18 months. And then he says, Steve, we're going back to the wilderness. You're going to, you know, you're Jacob wrestling with God. Mm -hmm. And for about three months, you know, I wasn't sure if we we're going to hold this thing together. Uh, you know, and, and, and God wasn't quick to resolve all those problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a lot quicker than I thought, but it wasn't, you know, there's was a few months of just asking big questions and I just felt like the Lord saying Steve I want you back again mm -hmm. and I'd like you to hand my church back mm -hmm. again and a deep deep work that was life-changing took place mm -hmm. in that period of time so as a leader I'd say you know keep pursuing the mission but give don't be surprised when when God wants to go to work on who you are mm -hmm. and bring you back to that wilderness place the byproduct of finding God in those times and surrendering to his will and purposes is often you'll see kingdom expansion as a byproduct rather than, you know, if I suffer enough, I'll get results. That's where I was at. And the Lord says, no, you walk with me. You walk in the footsteps of Jesus. You're engaged but every now and again, I'm going to bring you back to first things. So, so be aware of that as a pastor. And that's, it's out of who you are that you lead. But Jesus doesn't stay in the wilderness forever. You know, he affirms his mission. He's going to go to the cross. 
And then he steps onto the stage of history, full of the Holy Spirit, returns to Nazareth in the power of the Spirit, and and the whole thing takes off. You know. So just be aware of that dynamic. Mm. Uh, I know in the Australian context, and I, I'd be reasonably confident it'd be true in other countries as well, that for pastors, still talking to those pastors now, it's not the classic sex, money and power thing mm-hmm. that really caused them to hit the wall. It's yeah. discouragement. Yes. Yes. So how does a pastor, if, yeah. you, if you're living in a tough environment, in the, the context of Australian Christianity has been mm. in decline for six or so decades now as a mm. national reality. And uh, so the pastor, uh, they're struggling, they're strugg- just kind of, just trying to kind of hold their ground. Mm. And, and so how does a pastor uh, deal with that kind of heart issue of discouragement? Yeah. I'm just thinking about what you're saying there about identity. You want to link mm. identity and then discouragement because what I'm engaging with, I'm struggling with. Yeah, and you've got to break that nexus between your identity and the results in ministry. And you've got to find God in the discouragement, mm. even despite the discouragement. And um, now, I, I have a pattern of discouragement in my life. Um, I have a background with depression and about 10 years ago the wheels came off the wagon for six months I didn't know if I would be able to get back into ministry Mm. and it wasn't until I came to that place of saying Lord maybe you know this is how you are when you're at your worst maybe I'm just going to be miserable (laughs) the rest of my life maybe I'm not going to see my dreams fulfilled okay because you know, I was sitting down with a Christian counselor and, and I'm saying, I, I just, you know, am I going to fulfill my purpose? Am I going to leave a legacy? All of those things. And this guy's supposed to be nice to me, you know. That's what he's paid for. And he says, well, who promised you a legacy? Who promised you a purpose? And then he had the audacity to pull out a Bible from his, his, his drawer and start reading me verses about the love of God and his faithfulness. Mm. And he said, Steve, this is your only guarantee. Mm. And at that point, I said, okay, Lord, this is the deal. I'm miserable. <laughs> you know, that's just who I am at the moment. And I might stay miserable for a long time. But Jesus died for me. And he rose from the dead in a very real world. Not some vague spirit. He rose from the dead on this planet. Planted his feet. And he's going to return one day and I will have eternity with him and with the Father. Okay, I'm going to be discouraged. But I'd like that deal. I'll take that deal. And from that moment, there was a real shift. I began to minister. I got back into ministry. I began to minister as a free man. Whatever God gave me in ministry or the success of the books or our mission, all of those things were gifts of God. Because I'd been to my worst and found God in weakness. And the enemy has nothing to throw at you at that point. Because if when you're at your worst, you cry out to God and say, Okay, Lord, maybe I'm going to be, I thought, maybe I'll just work in a hardware store the rest of my life. You know, because uh, I thought, oh, that'd be nice. So I, in one sense, given up all those things. And in another sense, you know, as I, I grasp the living Lord Jesus, died and risen again, coming again for me, everything changed. And everything from that point is a gift. And I'm quite a, because I died, I'm quite a dangerous man. Because these things don't, hold me in mm. this so God can trust me with mm. fruitfulness mm. Mm. now that doesn't happen all the time in our lives but probably for most people listening in right now there'll come a point in their life where they're going to face that they don't have to be a pastor anybody mm. will. and God is faithful mm. I remember hearing Pastor Stuart Robinson say more than a decade ago uh, just in passing around one of the challenges he, he said um I died a long time ago. Yeah. Just kind of getting into yes. what you're saying. Okay, let's go back to this kind of the local church. Okay, stock standard local church. Here's the pastor. They're doing the best. How does the local church fuel multiplying movements? Right. 
Well, Neil Cole says, how you disciple the next new believer will determine whether you can see a multiplying movement. And the good news of that is it starts with how you're making disciples of the next new believer. And, um, you know, when I talk to pastors who are busy about all of this, they say, how can I sort of get one more thing? You know, we're supposed to reach our community. I'm just trying to keep the wheels turning, you know. And I just say, well, why don't you just do what Jesus did? Get out into your community. Just set aside. Michelle and I did this. Just, just set aside an hour and a half a week because we were too busy to make disciples when we were, we were leading an international mission agency, mm. you know. And we just got out into our local community. There just happened to be a lot of internationals and started connecting with people. One of the things we teach people to do is the early offer of prayer. Whether you know the person or you're meeting them for the first time, you just say, hey, we're just out and about offering to pray for people. And you'll be staggered how many people will be touched by that. And then often, if uh, that goes well, we'll bridge to, hey, has anyone ever shared the gospel with you? And we just share a simple gospel presentation because we're looking, not necessarily for a convert on the street or in the local neighborhood, we're just looking for somebody who'd like to sit down and read some of the gospel stories about Jesus and discover for themselves who he is. It's zero dollar. And we don't typically invite them back to a meeting at our church or our home. We just say, oh, when could we meet? Where could we meet? Who else would be interested? So just take an hour, hour and a half with someone else and go do that and get some training before you go. It'll change your life forever if you stick with it. Mm. You know, we've got, you know, we're talking about uh, discouragement and we do have to get back to identity. But just remember, Jesus didn't stay in the wilderness. He steps out into a new, you know, he's visiting every town and village in Galilee. And there's about 175 of them that we know. Of. So he's on the road taking his workers with him. And this is where all the stories of the Gospels come because he's encountered someone at a well or someone chained up in a cave or a rich guy who's oppressing the poor and he's bringing uh, the Gospel into those situations and making disciples. So find a way to start doing that, but don't do it alone. It'll change you. And, you know, that's where it starts for us all. Where it can go, uh, you know, there are now probably 30, 40 churches that have regular teams. Not everybody in the church, a smaller group, but regular teams out in their community looking for what Jesus called houses of peace. Mm. People are coming to Christ. The gospel's getting into the prison system. Um, and then out of that, they're building intentional uh, internships for volunteers who commit to a year or two years. And some of those people are forming new churches amongst Nepalese or, you know, this will be not in Nepal. This is in Texas, you know, or, or, uh, or it might be in Brisbane. Um, and some of those people now, two or three or four years down the track, are stepping out into world missions. You know, they're deploying to places like Pakistan. So it begins with a simple engagement with people far from God and some simple methods and tools that you not only uh, do, but you train your people to do. And stories got, start coming back of lives being changed. Uh, unsuspecting grandmas and primary or elementary school children start making disciples because you've taught them some simple methods and that will renew a church and renew your faith.